Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Video bandwidth is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is The Social Hour, Episode 3, with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur. Recorded Wednesday, April 13th, 2011. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to squarespace.com slash social hour. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Welcome to another edition of The Social Hour in Petaluma, California. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hello, Amber. It's Hi, episode Sarah. three. Uh, you have been on a crazy whirlwind of travel for the last week or so since we last met. So we're actually recording this live at a somewhat weird time for anybody who watches our, our live show normally. But here we are. We're, 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 we're pushing forward. Yes, uh, you know, nothing is as weird of a time as when we actually recorded while I was in Australia. And I think I got up at four in the morning to do the show. And uh, that was interesting. Uh, my mom was actually in the hotel room with me and I had to, uh, well, it wasn't quiet, obviously, but uh, it was uh, it was an interesting experience getting up in the middle of the night. And, and I actually stayed up from the point of finishing our recording on, Sarah. So I have to say that uh, it wasn't helping the jet lag at all. Oh, my gosh. You're a trooper, I got to say. I mean, you you seem to do very well on very little sleep, so kudos to you. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure it's a good thing, but <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, sometimes when you're a, when you're a social media expert, as you are, um, uh, the clock never stops. The internet never stops. Someone there, online so. always wants to talk to you. Uh, speaking <laughs> of speaking of being social, we obviously have a really good hour of socialness. We'll try to keep it to an hour. Last week we got down to an hour and twelve minutes. I think it's what we clocked out at, at which is pretty oh, good. Which is that's pretty, pretty good. good. Not too not too bad. But we're going to start off the show today uh, with our very first. Well, no, it's not our very first guest. It's our second guest, but our first guest on the show today. This is the co-founder and uh, CEO of Schematic Labs. In if you haven't heard of them, they are the makers of an app called Sound Tracking, which we've talked about on the show. In fact, our very first show, episode one, we talked about Sound Tracking a little bit, but we were sort of new to it and we were trying to get a feel for how it was different and unique and cool and social. To tell us more about that is the co-founder and CEO himself, Steve Jang. Welcome to the Social Hour. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So Amber and I were just talking a little bit about sharing the soundtrack of your life. I've been playing around with soundtracking quite a bit. I love it. Um, I'm a music person, so I think that someone like me, it's it's a really natural fit. But for anybody who's sort of like, well, you know, I'm already on Twitter and, and I already take photos and I share them with my friends and I've, I've got Facebook and how does soundtracking, why, why is it necessary for me? What would you say to them? Sure. Um, so it's we we made the app out of uh, like a, our our actual own personal need. Um, I think the the first time uh, I ever thought of an app that uh, does the things that sound tracking allows on the iPhone was when I was traveling. Um, I wanted to kind of share these moments that were happening uh, that included music, um, whether it was at an outdoor cafe and there was uh, a live musician playing or I was sitting on a train uh, in Europe at one point and listening to some music and looking at the scenery that we were passing by in the countryside. Um, and uh, another time, uh, I remember being in, in Barcelona at a live music club, and I really thought it would be great to show this, this really old neighborhood I was in in Barcelona and this, and, and this music that I was playing that sounded a lot like Manu Chao. And um, I just wanted to be able to share that moment with a location, a photo, in a song snippet. Uh, it didn't need to be the whole song, it just needed to be a snippet of the song uh, so that I could uh, sort of, you know, really vividly um, tell a story about what was happening at that moment, at that place, at that time. 
uh, with that music. And so, you know, I think uh, the 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 use case for the 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 folks that I think uh, get most excited about it now in our community are people that are already avid users of Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare, um, and are looking for something that allows them to share the music context, um, that that music moment, um, if you will, around what's happening in their life. And this is about the real world, not just about sort of um, uh, sort of tracking what you're playing on your computer or playing uh, just on your iPhone even, but it's really about um, uh, the music moment that you're experiencing, whether you're at a restaurant, cafe, you're sitting in the car in traffic, which, for example, in LA, we're seeing a lot of uh, soundtrack posts happening while people are sitting in rush hour traffic and um, and they're you know ex explaining what's happening to them or what they're feeling so, so I if we're looking at the app now we've got we've got a few major choices here you've got music search where you can actually search for an artist you can uh, you can soundtrack music that's actually playing uh, via your iPod or there's music ID where you would actually ID a song that would be playing on the radio while you're stuck in traffic in LA for example uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people are familiar with this concept from Shazam and Soundhound are two good examples of music uh, uh, technology that'll pull data from from ambient noise and try to figure mm -hmm. out what you're listening to. Does does sound tracking work the same way that these apps do? I mean, is there some algorithm that you had to build from scratch? Sure. So uh, we thought about uh, there are three basic situations that you're in, and we wanted to um, provide a product that allowed you to um, uh, effectively grab a song snippet and then be able to um, share that with other people. So the first one is where you actually know the name of the song and the artist, and, and the music search allows you to do that. You can enter in the artist name, and then once you start entering in a song title, it'll start doing an autofill, just much, you know, very similar to Google Instant Search. Um, you'll see uh, uh, song titles uh, start to autocomplete. Um, and that's effective for when you know the name of the song or when you are at a live show and you know the band and you know what song they're playing and you, and you want to be able to share that. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, option that you have is the Music ID feature, uh, which we use uh, an API uh, for from a company called Gracenote. And uh, they have a very large music database which offers um, a bunch of music fingerprints, song fingerprints, and allows us to match what is happening in the real world around you in terms of the audio uh, fingerprint and being able to match that um, with something in the GraceNote database. And so we've integrated with their API to be able to do that. And that's for when you don't know the name of the song or for some reason you want the uh, quick and easy way of just holding up your phone's uh, microphone to uh, the source of the, the sound, uh, such as a speaker. The third way is that, um, and which is quite popular as well, is um, what's playing on your iPod app on the iPhone. So when you have your earbuds in or you've got it plugged into a speaker, you want to be able to share that, and so that auto detects what's on your what's playing on your iPhone. And in the future, you'll see the ability to auto detect what song is playing on various apps uh, on the iPhone, um, and we're working on that as well. So, you know, there are so many different personalized radio stations out there that are, you know, it's a little more um, uh, complex in a lot of ways in terms of setting up your own radio station and sharing it. This seems to kind of fit into a category all on its own. I'm just curious, you know, how you explain it to people who haven't really tried it out as they're sort of, you, you say share the soundtrack to your life, but uh, as far as, as new users, what do you think it is about the service that is kind of getting them hooked and uh, wanting to share on a regular basis? Sure. I think, you know, I think you're right. I think there are a ton of music apps. I think um, actually uh, outside of games, I think uh, music apps might be the most sort of uh, popular uh, um, type of app that's being created by uh, developers. I, I think what we've done differently is we've tried to merge a lot of the great features that you see sort of, um, you see apps that do music ID very well. Um, and, and they just do that and, and that's been great. Um, it's, it's really uh, taught people and enabled people to do something that wasn't possible before. Then you see a lot of apps that are all about playback and consumption. Um, and there are a lot of great apps that do that. Um, and then you see a lot of photo sharing apps as well. These are all built around a, a specific utility. Um, and I think that's, that, that's an amazing thing. And, and an app like Sound Tracking probably wouldn't be possible without having some, a lot of those utility uh, uh, one feature apps um, exist and be popular. So I think what, how we've thought about our app and what's been popular with our community so far, we're, we're only five and a half weeks old. 
Um, but the, the community has really responded to the idea that you can share these music moments easily. So this, this app has a, a lot of features that you've seen in other applications, but we've tried to interweave these together so that the experiences, it takes a lot of the complexity of merging all those features together and making it very simple. Um, we, we're constantly trying to make it even more simple and we're really focused on uh, a lot of the UX, the user experience design around that. But to really focus it on the, the music fan who uses an iPhone and um, also enjoys using Facebook, Twitter, and Foursquare. So yeah, I mean, I'm looking a, at um, Aliza, a mutual friend mm -hmm. of Steve and my, uh, uh, shared Imagine by John Lennon. So we see where she was when she shared it. Um, I have the option to like it, to tweet it. Um, yeah. Then uh, I think most importantly, you can listen to a snippet of Imagine. It's not the full song because mm -hmm. it's taking snippets from iTunes. Isn't that right, Steve? But that's correct. Yeah, we're, what we're trying to do is just really give you the opportunity to send context of this experience, this music moment that you're having. Um, there are times in your life when you feel like you're kind of in a music video or you feel like you're having this moment in the song um, uh, sort of captures that. Uh, if, for example, like when you hear a certain song maybe from your past that reminds you uh, really strongly of an experience or a memory from a long time ago, that emotional impact, what we're trying to do is capture that in real time um, and let you share that with your friends. So, um, you know, a lot of people who've been uh, posting their their favorite music and 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 their photos on Facebook and Twitter have been really taking to the app and getting excited about it because it it lets you tell a story through music um, as well as a photo and a location um, all in sort of one music postcard um, as opposed to sort of trying to grab links off the open web and then copy and paste them into a particular app and then opening up another social app and trying to copy and paste and share from there. So I think a lot of what we've done is not um, uh, to create totally new interactions, but to really just take a lot of the experiences and features you see on other apps and, and, and blending them together for the music fan. So Steve, yeah. if I were to uh, if I were to like the song "Kites" that you shared with me by Geographer on Soundtracking, because we're Soundtracking friends, uh, I have a link to download in iTunes. How does Soundtracking yeah. uh, make money? Do you get a cut of referrals into the iTunes Music Store? Sure. So you know, if you're if you're a friend or, or following me on on Soundtracking, um, and you like the song that I happen to soundtrack. Um, then you have a one a one tap uh, uh, buy opportunity, and you can you can buy and, and download that song. And um, uh, iTunes has Apple iTunes has uh, a pretty robust affiliate program, and, and we get a small percentage of that of that purchase. That's our that's currently our only revenue stream. We, you'll see some stuff in in app purchases, and um, and in uh, uh, advertising um, integrated and hopefully creatively in the future. But um, for right now, it's a free application. And we want as many people to, to, to join and experience um, soundtracking and sharing that with their friends. Now, there are obviously so many different apps out there and there's a lot of competition in the marketplace right now. And I'm mm -hmm. sure there are people who are listening or who are watching who would love to just get your advice on how you get your app to kind of stand out because you've had some pretty great success. And like you said, soundtracking has only been around for a few weeks. Yeah, I, I'd say um, we... We've been working on it for a while, though. Um, we only recently launched it at South by Southwest in Austin. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, really trying to uh, get a lot of the backend functionality uh, uh, working uh, to the level at which we wanted. But I think we spent um, a lot of time on UI um, and really trying to get that experience down. I think that's there's a there's a whole sort of school of thought around minimum viable product and launching as soon as possible and then figuring out what to do with the product and iterating from there. Um, I think, I think that that's valid when, when you don't, uh, when, when you don't have a clear vision of what uh, you're trying to solve for the problem or the need that you're trying to solve for. Um, I think in our particular case with this app, and this may not be true for other apps that we'll, we'll be building in schematic labs, but um, definitely for this app, because we've been thinking about it for almost two years. Um, just as before we even became a startup our, ourselves, uh, we kind of knew exactly kind of what we wanted out of uh, this application because it was something that we wanted personally. And so I would suggest, you know, you know, I don't know if it's so much a science, but it's more of an art, but it's, it's just being able to um, visualize what you want to build and then um, paying a lot of attention to UI design and, and, and launching something that feels um, not, it's, it's never complete, but launching something that you feel happy about and you think that people will understand. 
So, Steve, you mentioned uh, trying to get uh, soundtracking into the hands of as many people as possible so they can enjoy it. You also launch right before South by Southwest, which is always a good time for folks to launch, especially when it's geolocation stuff, because you get all the nerds into Austin and everybody goes crazy with the new services. But uh, to, in order to launch at South by Southwest, did you have to put the Android app on the back burner? Because there are a lot of people using Android phones who get left out when, when services like this come into the iOS marketplace only. Yeah, I, I don't know that we... Uh I, I don't know if you know doing the Android app second was due to uh, South by Southwest or any launch time frame, but I think uh, we were excited to build on iPhone um, on, on the iOS platform and build something for iPhone users. Um, I think we're equally excited about Android. We just had to uh, make a decision. We're a small startup, so um, uh, it's hard to build on on both platforms and and, and make mistakes um, quickly on both platforms and learn from them with a small team. So I think we just decided to make um, our first set of mistakes on iPhone and learn from that and then try to build a good product there um, and stick to the vision as much as possible. And then move on once we've got, uh, we're feeling good about that, uh, move on to launching something for Android users who, you know, there are a ton of Android users that have um, requested uh, a, a sound tracking app for Android. And so we definitely have heard them and you know we, we want to build one and, and we're working on it right now. But you it's been fun. You mentioned that Schematic Labs is it's obviously the, the, the parent company, I guess you could say, of sound tracking. Sound tracking is your first product. But is yeah. this the new trend? I mean, do 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 you make a you put together a company um, and you've got a team and you work on a lot of different projects and that way if one project does well, then maybe you put more resources into that project and if another project doesn't do well, you scrap it, but that way you don't have to put all of your effort into an app that may be a hit and may not? Sure, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely a trend. I think a lot of people did this before without talking about it openly. I think a lot of startups kind of start out as like, we have a pretty good idea of what we want to do and we think it's uh, pretty exciting, but um, we're going to be open to trying several different things and iterating from there. And, uh, um, and I think a lot of stars probably didn't talk about it openly like that. Um, uh, but then I think now uh, it's been, I think for the entrepreneur and the startup and the, the product designers and creators out there, the, it's, it's, it's almost like it's okay to talk about like um, how you really are, are approaching it and, and all, the, all the truths and, and uh, honest facts about how to build these products. A lot of products fail. Um, you know, the, our, the sound tracking app started out as a, simply a music check-in app to just be able to um, associate a, a song and a location and a time together. And I think um, we got more excited about the expression elements and being able to actually sh really emotionally share something as we started building through a prototype of, uh, of this app. And um, even the name of the app um, uh, evolved into sound tracking. So I think now, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if that there are more startups that are actually, you know, there are more startups out there trying to take this incubator or portfolio approach. But I think, I think maybe perhaps startup folks are just getting a little bit more open and honest about it. <laughs> yeah, um, it makes yeah, sense. It, just out of curiosity, uh, most uh, app developers that I've spoken to, uh, especially recently, once they've had an app with some type of success, then they always have another app idea up their sleeves and something else that they want to create. Is there anything that you guys are working on right now or any enhancements to sound tracking that you can share with us? Yeah, so, well, so it's like a, a two-part question, so let me answer the first one. So, yes, um, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of startups and a lot of developers uh, talk about that next app, and I think it's fundamentally, um, there are a lot of similarities with websites, um, but there are some fundamental differences. Uh, the differences are that um, when you build a, a mobile app or an app versus a site, um, I, I think you ha there's, a, a, there's a sort of, a, a specialty involved in terms of the engineering, whether it's iOS or Android. And once you build one, you start to sort of learn a lot of dynamics about how to develop an app, how to design one, um, how to uh, ship it to the stores, um, market it, promote it, um, and how to um, essentially work with a lot of third-party APIs like Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, and all the SDKs out there. So to get a little technical, once you've worked with an SDK and you've worked with a set of API methods, 
and you've built a certain type of uh, software, whether it's a more of a sharing software or if it's a, com a, a community, it's a, some more straightforward social software, um, you start to get other sort of corollary ideas um, about what you can build. And I think there is some scalability in being able to um, develop multiple apps. Um, you can do multiple social apps on the same development platform. Um, and you start to really gain um, a lot of knowledge and experience in that area. So one, I think it's because you can do it. That's why people mm -hmm. want to do it. Um, and I think that's uh, definitely a little bit more sort of clean cut and possible now. Um, to, to answer your uh, second part of the question, which I've already forgotten. So if you could repeat that. that <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just curious <sighs> yeah. if you have another app up your sleeves. You, sleeve, you know, you're all, you've had a, a pretty yeah. good... Uh, run with this uh, first app. So I'm, I'm sure the uh, wheels are turning and there's something else that uh, hopefully in the works. Sure. So, okay. So this app, you know, we we launched almost six weeks ago. Uh, it's definitely not even um, close to being uh, the, the full vision of what we wanted to do. So we have a lot of work cut out for us. Um, there are always bugs to fix. Um, uh, someone mentioned the other week uh, something that I thought was uh, was pretty neat, which was um, uh, you spend 10% uh, of your time uh, creating bugs and 90% of your time fixing them um, <laughs> uh, in, so in software development. And so I think that's a pretty astute um, statement. Like, definitely, um, we have a lot of work cut out for us on Soundtrack. It's nowhere near feature complete, and we hope to continually, like, you know, delight and surprise uh, with what we're doing on Soundtrack and keep the community excited. We do have other apps planned. Um, the point of Schematic Labs even existing was you know a bunch of people formerly from iMeme, uh, which is a social music network, and stumble upon an Apple and Six Apart, which is pretty much um, um, our seven-person team right now. Um, uh, our reason for being is to create multiple apps. So um, beyond sound tracking, um, beyond you know a sound tracking app for Android, uh, we also um, have plans other social entertainment apps that uh, really focus in on uh, on creating. Um, a better experience out of your real world passions. So sound tracking is about your passion for music um, and sharing those moments. And then we have other apps uh, upcoming in the social entertainment space, um, in movies, shopping, fitness, um, where you know you have passionate uh, um, pursuits that you're involved in. Um, and, and we want to create an app and a community that uh, help amplify that experience that you're already um, excited about. Steve, I know you have to scoot in a couple, but just one last question uh, before we wrap up. When, when, you, uh, when you like a song, when I say, oh, I dig the song that Steve has shared with me on Soundtracking, there's, there's, I have a unique choice that none of the other social networks have given me thus far. I can either like it or I can love it. Now, what is going on there? Why are you giving me too many choices? Is it because, is it because some songs are like, eh, this is fine, and other songs you think, oh my gosh, it's life-changing, I love the song, it makes me cry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a um, good observation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so you know, I, I think in the social web right now, there's this concept of, you know, some sort of, like Facebook has a like, um, Twitter has a favorite. A lot of services say love, and they use the icons of a heart or a star or a thumbs up. Um, I, I think that's pretty cool. It's, it's basically saying you either uh, approve of something um, or you don't. Um, I tended to think about music in particular and, uh, and a lot of things actually in life that, yeah, you know, I'm kind of into something. Um, I kind of like that. And then some things I was like, that's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> It's the best thing I've ever heard in my life, right? And so, um, you know, just as a, an experiment, and you know, who knows if we'll stick with this, and it may change. We may add more levels and icons of loving and liking. Um, but we just felt like it was it would be a neat experiment to try out, um, giving people the option to say, "Hey, I really love something," versus, "Hey, I kind of like it, but you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't love it." And so, um, uh, there's the comment. Uh, option which allows you to just kind of explain how you're exactly feeling about it or what you're thinking about the soundtrack but um when you you know when you're sharing the soundtrack to your life it's pretty it's pretty cool to see when people are really moved by it and they're and then they say they love it and then some people are saying that they just like it and i think that's re reflects sort of reality yeah Very choice cool. is good steve i'm yeah. going to just ask you a really super quick question i know you have to go but what is the soundtrack to your life right now Wow, um, good question. Wow, that, that's a, that one caught me off guard. So um, I think nowadays I've been listening to a lot of uh, garage rock, lo-fi, 
and uh, dub, Jamaican dub. I think, uh, <laughs> so I've been listening to like Lower Dens, uh, Tame Impala, uh, the Black Keys, uh, the Black Angels, a little bit of psych rock in there. Um, I think it's just been, you know, we've been busy working in the office and doing a little bit of traveling for work. And so um, a lot of music that's a little bit more sort of like deep and rich and kind of, um, you know, bluesy has been like a good like balance for me. But yeah, so I'm kind of in that mode right now. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us so and much, uh, sharing your story. And hopefully we'll have you back on when you come up with the, the next app. Yeah, when Schematic Labs comes out with their next app, you have to promise to come back and give us the first look. For the second. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Thank you. See you around Peace. town. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> it's funny, Amber. Um, Steve is he's he's a really modest guy, but he uh, he's he's one of my most musical kind of like freakish friends. You know, one of those people who you're like, how do they have time to go to four shows a week? Yeah. I'm just trying to get enough sleep at night, kind of thing. So this is actually you know he mentioned I meme that was a previous project of Steve's. In fact, I think I met him originally when he when he was um working with i mean but it's 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 fun when you when you know folks who have built something and you know uh that in their heart it really does mean something to them yeah definitely and i mean the reason i i wanted to know about the soundtrack to his life is that he seems so calm and uh just so at ease you know i'm sure he's super busy but i'm thinking i need to listen to some music that this guy listens to <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> he seems very chill. So uh, really fun to have him on, Sarah. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, Amber, we, we mentioned at the beginning of the show, but it's worth repeating. We're, we're, we're shooting this live at an odd time. And if you're subscribed to the show already and you're, you're watching it on demand through whatever device or or your choice it doesn't really matter but for anybody who wants to watch the show live we really encourage it normally uh, and this is a new show so we're starting to get into normal mode we're not quite there yet we do record the social hour live on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern and that's 11 a.m. Pacific if you can't watch it live that's okay we try to put it up um, as quickly as possible afterwards at switt.tv slash TSH that's the link to our website, which are, this particular show will be up later tonight, and episodes one and two are already there as well. And if you want to contribute to the show, I mean, if you if you have guest ideas for you know, someone like Steve that you know, and you go, oh, there's such they made this great app. You guys got to talk to them. Let us know. Um, variety of ways to get a hold of us. The social hour at twit.tv is our email, or you can send us a voicemail too. Um, it's a Google Voice account two six two six social. It's a weird. Voicemails number. are awesome. Yeah, they are. But, uh, but yeah, so we're, you know, we're, I think it's, um, I think uh, there are so many people that we can be talking to that it's a little bit overwhelming, but, um, but it's really fun to, to be able to, to, to talk to folks who are kind of inventing new ways to share with folks. Amber, I don't know if you were ever a big Blip FM user. I, I haven't used the site regularly in a while, but soundtracking feels a lot like Blip to me, except mm. that I can just kind of have it in my pocket. I mean, obviously yeah. it's iPhone only, but... Yeah, I definitely used a uh, uh, Blip, Blip FM and uh, I totally got hooked on it. I mean, I tend to jump on these services and then go on to the next new thing. So um, I don't think I used Blip for that long. Um, sound tracking, though, like you said, it seems just easier because it is in your pocket all the time. And it's just a, the access is uh, really, really simple. So uh, I, I could see it just being hit because, you know, music is so important to so many people. I know I love I'm a, a big music fan and it, I always have music on. So if I can share stuff that fast. I think it's just a fun way. I mean, even more interesting than sharing links because it just it automatically evokes an emotion in people. So uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a big winner for them. All right. Well, uh, before we get on to the rest of the show, want to take a quick, brief moment, a happy moment to thank Netflix. They are our first sponsor today. And if you don't use Netflix, I guarantee you that you're missing out on something really wonderful because Netflix is the way to watch thousands of TV episodes and movies and, and uh, I mean, so much content either on your PC or your Mac. I mean, on your computer or uh, streamed to your TV uh, via um, a Netflix device. Um, I use my Apple TV, although I've got a 
a TV, um, never really use it, but it's in the bedroom that actually has a Netflix widget. Uh, it's a Sony Bravia TV, so I actually have Netflix capabilities straight from the TV from within those settings. Xbox 360, PS3, uh, and, you know, the list goes on. You get the idea. The whole idea is to not have to go to the store and rent a movie because that is like the archaic way to do things. Uh, Netflix is the best. So, Amber, have you, um, what's the last movie that you watched? Oh, you know, Sarah, well, since it was a 15-hour flight from uh, Sydney to Vancouver and another five from Vancouver to Toronto, I think I watched <laughs> about, I don't know how many movies on the plane. Uh, the last one I watched was, uh, oh, it was uh, Secretariat. It's a, a movie about uh, a winning racehorse. Mm. Uh, really, really good movie if you're uh, an animal fan and uh, a really nice story as well. So that's probably the last one I watched. And then a bunch of uh, silly romantic comedies, which I'm, I'm secretly a fan of, especially when I'm flying because it just uh, hey, makes I'm you relax a little judge. bit. The nice thing about Netflix is you've got your new movies. You know the kind of movies that you might see on a plane and go, oh, this is a really great movie. I wish I'd seen it sooner. Netflix has new releases. It also has classics um, on its uh, instant uh, list. They're adding movies all the time. Gone with the Wind, uh, as of April 1st, is now available via Netflix Instant Streaming. That's a great movie, you know, and you don't necessarily think about it, but now that it's right in front of you and it's just a little click and you start streaming the movie, it's wonderful. By the way, if you're not familiar with Netflix, it's not just streaming. You can actually sign up to get DVDs sent to your mailbox. Go out, open up the DVD, watch it, keep it as long as you want. There's no late fees or anything like that. Once you send back your DVD, then you get a new one, and you manage your queue online. So you just sign up for a Netflix account. By the way, um, we have a special account where you can get free for 30 days, netflix.com slash twit. Sign up, check it out, uh, fill up your queue with all these movies that you've wanted to watch, or maybe even movies where you go, eh, I don't know. I, it wasn't worth it to, for me to go all the way to the theater, but maybe I'll like the movie. Netflix is great for that sort of thing. So it's movies that you never were able to see or you, you're just not sure about. You don't want to get off the couch. It is easy. So again, Netflix.com slash twit is our special code to get free Netflix movies and TV shows. Whole series. I mean, not just one episode of a TV show. You could watch uh, Tom and Eileen are watching uh, Buffy. The entire oh, nice. series of Buffy. I mean, that takes a while. Um, that's available via Netflix. So That's the only way to watch series, though, I have to say. Just watch them all at once. You know, just get some good food, sit down, have an all-nighter, and uh, watch the uh, whole series. That's how I watch series like The Wire and Dexter. Uh, just being able to plow through them is the best, uh, the best way. Absolutely. Totally agree. Netflix.com slash twit, and we thank them so much for supporting this episode of The Social Hour. Uh, Amber, I don't know how much you have have been following the Facebook comments um, controversy. I say controversy because it seems like people either they love Facebook comments because it's an easy way to integrate a social capabilities into you know, your blog or a lot of um, a lot of websites are using it as well. And other uh, folks say you're giving Facebook too much control over the comment section. You know, it's kind of like the way some folks got up in arms over the Facebook like button where you would like an article and then all of a sudden it goes to your profile and people can share it from there. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, do you, do you, do you, do you feel I one way or another Facebook about, comments. do you? <laughs> I do. I, I have to say I'm a big fan. I have Facebook comments uh, uh, integrated on my website and, and uh, I, I, I just think it works really well. I, I'm one of those people that uh, I do love commenting on people's blogs and, and on articles out there. And when I know I can log in with Facebook, it's just a simpler thing for me than going and signing up. And, and if I have to register on whatever type of commenting system they're using, I just won't do it. And so one of the things I think that makes the web obviously so interesting with so many people is conversations that are happening happening in the comments area, uh, whether it's on your favorite news site or, um, you know, on a blog. And so to me, this just, uh, it just makes it so dead easy for anyone to uh, participate. And I know there are issues, like you said, people uh, do, there are people who don't like it. They think, like you said, you're giving too much information to Facebook. And uh, my feeling about that is just that, you know, this is a, it's an opt-in service, right? If you don't feel comfortable, then you don't have to use it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're looking at um, a TechCrunch article, actually, that uh, is an article about how Facebook comments have become more social. But TechCrunch themselves use Facebook comments. So, you know, if, if I wanted to add a comment on this page, um, well, actually, by 
account isn't set up on this computer yet. But if I was logged in with Facebook, you know, it would show my little Facebook profile here. It would give me an option to comment uh, using a Facebook account. We've got Yahoo, AOL, or Hotmail. So you have some options. You can also uh, opt to use, if you have a page set up, Amber, you and I do. Um, some mm. people do for various reasons. You can comment as, you know, the, the head of a business, for example, if, you're, if your company has um, its own Facebook page. But uh, Facebook comments have actually gotten more social. Like I said, this article highlights a few of them. Uh, you've got permalinking, uh, so users can access comments by the comment permalinks. Um, we know permalinks uh, you know, on tweets, for example, that can be really helpful if you just want to send somebody a URL to that particular tweet, not the tweet stream, and, and it gets kind of complicated when people are logged in with different accounts. Um, access to the comments API. Uh, so if you are a larger site, I think would probably use this more than than, than you or I. If you wanted to rank your comments or highlight an interesting comment, you have some control over how they start looking. Um, so it's not just the same, oh, Facebook comments, they all look the same. You, 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 can, you can make them prettier, I guess, and make them work better mm -hmm. for you. Um, I think you can brand them a little bit, right? So if you have a, um, if you want to use darker colors, for example, and something that kind exactly. of fits in better with the look and feel of your site, you have the option to do that too. Yeah, there's a darker color scheme, which it's funny, Alexi Totsis, who wrote this article for TechCrunch, was like, gosh, I, I'm kind of shocked that no one had thought of this before. And I think she's right. I think we're so used to seeing Facebook look a certain way mm. that it's almost so obvious that you could actually just skin the comments area. What if you've got a, a, a site with a dark background? I mean, the big Facebook window that looks a lot like everyone else's comment section might not be the best call for you. So it's, I like it too. I mean, I tend to agree with you. I, I, I don't have a problem with giving Facebook too much control. If I feel that that's where the majority of my users are on anyway and will be interacting from and I can I mean let's face it if I write an article and I get a lot of comments and people are then and by the way you can choose whether you want to post your comment and the corresponding article on your on your news feed or not within Facebook but if you do there's a higher chance that more people will read what I wrote or what I said or my video or whatever I'm sharing um, and that's good for exposure for all of us. Exactly. And I just, I don't know, I guess uh, I just love the way that it kind of looks on, on websites. And I love the, the idea that uh, there are people in the comments area. And what I mean by that is because you're logging in with your Facebook account and it's pulling your profile picture, it just, it just makes it seem like a much more social environment to be part of a conversation because everybody's Facebook uh, images are shared there as well. And it looks like from this article that more than 50,000 sites are currently using uh, the latest Facebook commenting upgrade. So that's pretty substantial. And uh, I know, you know, other people that have been using it who are, are, are huge fans and, and just say that it is increasing the quality of the comments. Uh, maybe not as many people will come in and there's obviously not as many anonymous comments, but the quality of the conversation is better. And I think that's something we all strive for as content developers online. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, there is definitely the argument that Facebook requires you to use your real name and, and is this a privacy mm. issue and does it change folks' behaviors and, and, and are, we, are we clamping down on a more um, comfortable discussion by folks having to share too much about themselves? And I don't know if everyone's going to ever agree on, on what the right way to do this is, but I will say that especially certain sites, I mean, we all know them. It's like, look at YouTube comments. I mean, if, if YouTube comments were not anonymous, then the comments area would be a lot better. Uh, so Facebook's <laughs> got that going on in that regard, I think. Um, I'm so scared of YouTube comments, I swear. <laughs> it's a frightening place to, for me just because, uh, uh, like you said, there are just so many people who are, are, are comfortable being in there and writing anonymous things that it gets ugly really fast. Even if the most genuine, wonderful videos have been uploaded there, you go in and it's just uh, filled with, uh, uh, infested, I should say, with uh, negativity. <laughs> It's true. Uh, yes, very much so. It's uh, it can be good. You know, you gotta you gotta. If I have to tell you who I am, even if I think something bad, I may be less inclined to say so and upset you and ruin your day. So in that regard, there's something good uh, going on as far as uh, less anonymity in the exactly. comment sections. You know, Amber, I don't know if you noticed, uh, but uh, I think it was Matt Cutts actually who I follow on Twitter had um, had linked to a Twitter account called a Google a day. And so I went to the account the other day 
It's got, you know, over 3,000 followers, and it's like a Google day. Well, what is this? So it turns out, and I don't know if you've played around with this at all, that Google is getting into a bit of a trivia game that it's trying to make social. Um, and I guess the best way to describe it is, is that they've got a question of the day. Um, and this is, by the way, a Google a day uh, when you go to it, when we're looking at this right now. It looks a lot like Google.com, but it's not. It's actually a completely different site um, where they, they give you a trivia question. For example, today's question is, if you were a ferry passenger traveling from continental Europe to the country with twice as many sheep as people, in what town would you most likely dock? Now, if I wanted to just find out, I could have them show me the answer. Or I could... Um, I could, well, I could follow the, the account on Facebook or Twitter. I could share this question with friends if I wanted to kind of be like, okay, let's all get into this trivia question. I, you know, I bet Amber knows the answer to this or something like that. Or I could search within this special version of Google that keeps, a, I mean, I guess for the best way to describe it is it keeps me from cheating or it keeps other results from folks that would show up in regular Google from showing up on a Google a day. So in, in our case, you know, we'll just go ahead and show the answer. Turns out it's Iceland. So yes, uh, a town in Iceland. And I am, I cannot pronounce the name of the town, Maybe. Sarah. It's, it starts, <laughs> starts with an S, ends with an R. It starts with an S. This is really fun, though. Uh, I was uh, just uh, playing around with the site a little bit. And uh, I'm so curious if this was one of Google's ideas, you know, in terms of the staff having, uh, you know, the, the, I think it's a 20%, um, 10 or 20% of time, they're able to go off and come up with their own uh, fun little projects. And this seems like that probably came out of that, uh, just because it, it's, it's just so creative and just a quirky, fun little way to be able to use the, the power of the search engine. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's cool. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, well, where is it? A Google a day. Yeah, so it's like if I was to say, oh, I, you know, if I was to search for Iceland, Google a day starts giving me very generic, well, not generic, but, but, but general um, results for the country of Iceland, not something like, hey, I've got your Google a day cheat board, or <laughs> here are all the answers to you know Google's Iceland question, that sort of thing. So it's almost like it forces you to use Google as an encyclopedia with fewer results, but for a good reason. It's a game, uh, you know, we, the, the gamification, you keep hearing that word online now. All, every company wants to sort of make using their services more fun. So oh, yeah. this definitely it's seems like some sort of side project from a Google employee. Though. Yeah, so. for sure. And uh, someone wrote a comment on the uh, Google a day Twitter account. And I think this really uh, hits a nail on the head where they said that this is great for someone who wants to enhance their search skills. So for people who are new to Google, I mean, we take it for granted that we all know how to use Google and, and we're experts in finding things quickly. But if you were new to the whole experience and you wanted to kind of play around with it, maybe your mom or dad is just getting into using the internet or, or grandparents, then this is a, a fun way to kind of get them immersed in the, the whole environment and, uh, and, and, and playing a little bit too. Yeah, exactly. It's like if, if you think uh, your, your grandma, Grandma Dorothy, that's my grandma's name, would enjoy <laughs> this, she, she would actually have no idea what I was talking about if I even said the word Google, but let's just say she did. I could go ahead and challenge her with this question, you know, via Twitter or probably Facebook or, or Buzz, of course, or good old-fashioned email as well. So kind of fun. You know, it's, it's a fun, especially fun. if you're a trivia buff and yeah. you guys out there know who you are. It's fun. I think of uh, my grandmother came to uh, Australia with me and, and my mom as well. And uh, she uh, isn't online at all. And it's funny because I asked her, I said, well, you know, would you love to have a, a computer and start using email? And she's almost 90. And she said to me, she said, you know what, Amber, I think it's too late for me to really understand how to use the internet. Aww. So she has lost all hope. But however, we all know from all the stats out there that one of the fastest growing demographics as far as people using Facebook and other social sites is truly grandparents and people 65 and older who are just uh, latching on and spending so much time on these different uh, networks. So uh, um, I think that's kind of fun to think that, especially the generation growing up now, I mean, everybody's grandparents is gonna know how, are going to know how to use many of these services. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, another service that a lot of people can use, uh, before we get into some of our viewer feedback, and we got a lot we, after our first couple shows. I'm really, I know. I'm really so excited about all the feedback, great questions and comments and good stuff. So we'll get to that in a second. But you mentioned um, some of the older generations, uh, the generations who are less comfortable with some of our 
our, our new fancy gadgets that, that beep and, and spin and, and have touch screens. Anybody <laughs> can blog, can't they? Yes. All you have to have is something to say or a picture to share or, or, or maybe all you use is Twitter and you just want to create a page that has a, a, a pretty Twitter stream with some nice colors. You can do all of that with Squarespace. Squarespace is our second sponsor on the show. Uh, Squarespace, if you're not familiar, uh, Amber and I are both very familiar with Squarespace. Squarespace is awesome. It is the best way to publish a website, a blog, um, but it doesn't have to be a blog. I mean, it can be, uh, you know, if you're a photographer, it can be a really cool photo gallery. You can you can import a Flickr widget. Um, you can, well, let me go to squarespace.com and I'll, I'll show you because uh, Squarespace gives you a lot of options and it's so of options easy. options and a lot of examples of what people can do because I think a lot of people when they when they think about blogging they think well you know okay maybe I do have something to say but this is all very daunting I don't know design I I don't I don't want to have to maintain something that's going to be time consuming and complicated with Squarespace you don't actually have to do any of that I mean you could be uh, very comfortable with CSS and 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 know how to put together a website that's that's unique and and customized. Amber, I know that you have a lot of experience with that, but I don't. I never have. I've never really put the time into learning. So Squarespace gives you a lot of just uh, really cool templates that you can either build off of, or you don't even have to to make a change. You just start typing. You type about your day, and that's good to go. And you've got this beautiful blog. Yeah, it's, you know, one thing that I love about Squarespace, too, is that it's just an end-to-end -end solution. And uh, what I mean by that is people will ask me, they'll say, well, should I use WordPress or should I and try to host my own site? And if they're new to going online and, and building up some type of presence on the web, the nice thing about Squarespace is that they don't have to worry about anything. I mean, literally, they can just go in and within five or ten minutes get a site up and running and all of the maintenance is, uh, is handled on, on Squarespace's side so they don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know servers and uh, their site going down and being able to deal with that Squarespace is responsible for that so they can just focus on writing and, and creating really interesting content for their visitors it's so true uh, if you want to try out Squarespace we have a special offer for you because that's what we're doing on the show today we're giving you special offers if you want to try out Squarespace for 14 days squarespace.com slash social hour is the way to do it so you can try it out you can even import a blog if you've got a wordpress blog or a typepad blog and you just want to give it a go squarespace will let you just just try it out you don't need to enter credit card information or anything and they don't you know if you if you decide that uh that that you you need to um export your information at any point they're not going to give you grief about that there are import as well as export options as well pricing plans are very reasonable but again if you're looking for a really good solution their customer service is awesome i've asked them so many questions they've never gotten mad at me because like i said i don't really know what i'm doing <laughs> when it comes to the design part of things uh squarespace.com slash social hour is the way to test it out see if it's right for you we love it and we thank them so much for supporting us on the social hour amber should we get to some of our uh feedback from folks yeah you know we have one of our questions i'm really loving right now and it's a uh, um i think it's the first one up uh, from sarah in florida who uh, first of all congratulates us on the new show Thanks. and talks about how she's been uh, doing online dating recently and uh and going around town finding different halfway points through things like uh, Yelp or Spoon and, and uh, Google Maps and uh, getting user ratings. And she's talking about with so many companies in competition to get their rating system embraced universally. I wonder what you would use to help pick the place based on reviews for a blind date. Uh, and a really fun question. It is a fun question. My initial response was, huh. So Sarah is, she's, she's dating people that, you know, she wants to meet at a safe place, right? You know, somewhere where, you know, it's a coffee shop mm -hmm. where they're not just going to be the two of them. But what if it goes well? You know, she wants to pick a cool place that, that a lot of other people like. So it's not sort of a dud of a, of, a, of a location, you know, to start that new romance type of thing. And I thought, well, um, Yelp. Um, she already yeah, mentioned Yelp Urban great. Spoon. Um, she's familiar with Google Maps. But it sounds like she wants a one, an all-in-one kind of an aggregator to try to not have to be visiting all these different services every time she wants to figure out if that new burger joint is all, you know, it's cracked up to be. I actually, um, 
when I went to, you know, I just, somebody had, I asked somebody, hey, is there is there a place that does all of this in one? And he said, well, what about Google Places? Um, Google Places is actually, um, I'm looking at the Google Maps um, entry for Zuni Cafe, which is, I mentioned burgers. It's this place near my house that they have really good burgers. They're, you know, kind of known for their burgers. This actually came up uh, via Google Places, which um, if you just go to places.google.com, what it'll uh, initially do is um, it'll pull up restaurants and, you know, if you're looking for restaurants, uh, places that are near you location-wise. But let's say, you know, I just wanted to, to um, if I went to places, let's see what it pulls up in the... Uh, in the Petaluma area. Yeah, Places is great. I mean, like you said, it has a lot of uh, um, good feedback on different uh, locations. Yeah, what they're trying to do is not only get uh, businesses to list themselves on Google Places, but for people like you and me to rate via Google Places. So again, mm -hmm. okay, so these are all, it's actually going back to where I was uh, in the past because I'm, I'm logged in as myself, so it knows my information. Um, but Zuni Cafe, for example, you kind of go like, okay, well, average rating, four stars, and it has over 3,000 ratings. Okay, well, that sounds pretty good. Then when you actually go to the page itself, uh, Sarah in Florida, I, I mean, it's got a lot of information now. It's pulling from the user reviews if you if you start to um, expand on these stuff's coming in from city search from open table um, from uh, TripAdvisor uh, reviews around the web so Google places is actually pulling in more than just the obvious um, dinner ratings type thing we've got Yelp again urban spoon then you know it's got really nice map information. If you click on the if you click on the map, then you get Google Street View options. So I mean, I think that this is probably her best bet if she wants yeah. the most amount of reviews in, in one, one place, place, which is not only kind of reviews from all over the web, even even folks who haven't actively contributed to Google Places yet. Yeah, but, I they mean, can. It's, you can take a look at it and see if the neighborhood looks weird. This neighborhood. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a great feature as well. Just be able to suss out what the area is like too. I have to say, I, I'm going to plug my uh, my friend uh, does a podcast called the Dating Digital Podcast, oh, cool. and it's available at datingdigitalpodcast.com. And it's a really fun show. Um, it's an audio podcast, just talking about the whole experience of uh, dating online. So uh, Sarah may be interested in uh, taking a listen and uh, just uh, you know everybody on the show is, shares their experiences of uh, of their uh, uh, lives on eHarmony and other sites. So I think she'd find that to be a fun one. Absolutely. Uh, and so this is another interesting email too from, uh, I guess it's from Tom. Yes. Xbox from last week. Yes. So Tom's question is, he was, um, this is in, in um, last week, we, we had initially on episode one, we'd talked about how I had had an issue with Verizon. I had publicly tweeted about my issue. Verizon had gotten back to me, and it all worked out okay. And some folks said, well, that's, you know, you, you have more followers than I do, so that's not really a fair story. So I, we said, well, if you've got good stories, send them in. So last week we had read an email from uh, Kevin, who had had a good experience with the Xbox folks because he had a problem with the red ring on his Xbox, and he got that all sorted out. This email is from Tom, who says, listen, your discussion of Kevin's rapid reply from Xbox to his Twitter post perked my ears. I'm assuming Xbox support didn't go to the trouble to follow every single person on Twitter. So how did they see his post and how did they see it so quickly? Is there a feature I'm not aware of that allows real-time search of all streams for keywords? And does the NSA know about this? Just curious. <laughs> Amber, I think, I think Tom might not be familiar with the beauty that is saved Twitter searches. Yeah, I mean, many companies out there are essentially uh, following streams of uh, topics that are happening and they're saving those Twitter searches. And so they're able to uh, stay on top of what anyone is saying about a certain topic. There's also lots of online monitoring tools. Uh, I use Hootsuite right now and uh, you can go in and just, you know, constantly be searching a certain term. For instance, I have the title of my book in there. And so anytime anyone mentions my book, I can, I'm can i notified that uh, there is a tweet sent out so I can respond really quickly. So yeah, you don't need to be following someone to uh, uh, take part in a conversation and be aware of what they're talking about. So most big brands will in fact do safe searches and use other listening tools to be, make sure that they're able to actually help out and uh, do customer service efficiently online. Exactly. I mean, we're looking at my save searches here. 
you know, I, I sometimes just search for my name and that will, you know, you know, sometimes someone will, whether it's good or bad, have feedback on something that I've done and they're not at replying to me. They're just mentioning. I mean, maybe they're mentioning that Sarah and Amber are doing a show and I want to know about that. I also have the misspelled version of my name because that happens a lot. And so it's like the, this is feedback that I'm, I'm interested in, maybe. Um, and some, sometimes these, these, um, the uh, the search terms don't end up being what I want them to be, but I still want to be able to look through it. I've had today, for example, I'll have to add the social hour as well. But I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that um, Tom's question, like, how do the Xbox people know about this? Because Kevin's tweet didn't actually at reply Xbox. He was just saying, mm. oh, my Xbox, it's all messed up. I'm sure they have a save search um, or like you said, Hootsuite options where you get an alert anytime someone mentions you. I mean, this is... It's like the the more specific version of Google Alerts, really. I mean, it's all the same yeah. idea. When a specific term gets mentioned, you want to follow that term, you get notified. I do have to say, and I don't, I don't know if you run into this because, um, I, I mean, I can't imagine that you have very many haters, but I have a few. And every once in a while, I'll do a search for my name, and it's like the person has clearly not at replied me because they weren't really trying to oh and you can to, see to, yeah to ping me directly but i see that they've said something so it's like it can work for or against you i guess mm -hmm. in the case of xbox they want to know if somebody has something negative to say because they want to help sometimes i want to help too but it's just a matter of you know preference <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean the whole head. the whole listening business online has become a a huge uh, area for a lot of companies and uh, i think i mentioned just briefly a uh, radian six is a, another service that allows you to set up these really enhanced uh, um, searches so you can see what anyone is saying on blogs on facebook across other social media sites and if you are wondering just how big this business is radian six was just bought by salesforce.com for i think 326 million dollars and crap. so you know, that's, that's software that allows you essentially to listen and monitor your reputation online. So um, companies aren't taking this area lightly and there many of them are uh, pay, uh, paying attention to what people are saying about them and it's become a really big part of their marketing strategies. Yeah, and I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I feel like there are enough use cases where I think um, we can encourage folks you know, you want to interact with other folks and brands. I mean, obviously, you know, you want to be as polite as possible, but you do get results, um, especially with big companies like Microsoft, uh, who have big brands like Xbox and they want you to be happy. And it's probably not too much trouble for them to help you um, if you're vocal enough about it. So, Tom, hopefully that answered your question. I don't think the NSA needs to be contacted. Uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, I think. I think Twitter's doing okay with this. So if you want to write us, the social hour at twit.tv is our email. If you want to leave us a voicemail, it's 2626 social. I know that's pretty much the weirdest voicemail ever, but that's our voicemail. It was the only one that had the word social in it that I could find. Uh, and if you want to record a video, We've gotten a couple of videos. Um, love the videos. Try to keep voicemails and videos, if you can, to around 30 seconds or less. Um, that mm -hmm. way we can incorporate them into the show a little bit easier. Obviously, we got a lot of stuff to talk about, so that's very helpful. But if you want to record a video, it can be um, some feedback or a tip or a trick or anything like that. Just uh, record it, upload it somewhere, YouTube or Vimeo or or really anywhere where you can send us a link so I can open it um, and I don't have to download it as an attachment, that would be great because we love to see you. And and I know uh, when Amber and I were trying to think of what was the best format for the social hour, um, we both agreed that the more interaction we had with everybody who's listening and watching, the better. And you can keep us on our toes, of course. That too. <laughs> uh, before we get into a couple social tips, and I have... A social story as well talking about haters not really I uh, wanted to quickly thank audible they're our third sponsor we're just I mean we we're a popular show Amber so we've got three sponsors I'm really excited about that um, so far if you're not familiar with audible um, I think Amber you probably have uh, were a, an audiobook user long before I was because you do so much more traveling than I do yeah, you know, I've definitely listened to audiobooks. I it's it's kind of dwindled a little bit over the past couple of years, um, but uh, I'm starting to listen to more. In fact, I just uh, um, on my flight back from Australia, I just downloaded. Uh, uh, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm just blanking out on the name of the book. I think it's Life uh, by. Uh, 
um, the guy from the Rolling Stones, and uh, that's uh, read by Johnny Depp. I think we've talked about it before on oh, the yeah, show. Oh yeah, the Keith Richards autobiography. Yeah, yeah, Keith Richards, and uh, so that's a great one. And uh, so I'm trying to get b back into the audiobooks because it's so handy. I mean, especially uh, if you are, just want to be able to uh, clean your house and listening to an listen to an audiobook or take a flight. And um, like I mentioned, I've seen every movie I think that is uh, out right now. So I, I had to find a new form of uh, entertainment. Audible.com is the place to have, I, I, I mean, it's, it's almost, it's every audiobook that I've ever wanted. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I could really try to stump if, if I tried, but I have to think of something outside the 75,000 or so titles that they have available. Audible is the best. Um, literature, fiction, nonfiction. I, you know, I, Amber, I don't know about you. I'm a fiction girl because when I read a book, I like to get lost in the book. And yeah. I don't want it to be about real life. Some people prefer nonfiction. Uh, Audible has both of those things. So it's not just, you know, you're not, if you don't want to read Shogun, you can read Life by Keith Richards and learn a little bit about a real person. Periodicals as well. You can, um, there are a variety of newspapers that you can listen to. And that is a really cool, hey, you know, I don't think a lot of people um, think about uh, having newspapers read to you. But hey, if you're commuting, you know, I, I drive the better part of two hours every day. I can't read the newspaper. I simply don't have time. And I'm stuck in my car. And wouldn't it be nice to have a soothing voice reading a story to me about a tech, uh, tech news story that, that I may need to talk about on TNT later on. Um, yeah, Audible, Audible's good stuff. We love Audible. And um, I'm trying to figure out what my next Audible pick should be. The Keith Richards documentary is a good one. Um, yeah, I think we've done that as our pick once before, because I think Leo got me kind of hooked on that book. Um, I'm a big nonfiction fan, so... Are you? Uh, I read a ton of business books and I'm starting to think that they all kind of, not that they all sound the same, but I need to branch out from there a little bit. <laughs> However, I do get hooked on a lot of those books by like Guy Kawasaki and uh, Seth Godin. And I know a lot of those are on Audible too. Just look, see what their latest uh, books are here. Well, whether you want fiction or nonfiction or anything in between, like I said, Audible is the place. They have the most titles by a landslide. They're easy to work with. They're good folks. They're friend of Twit. Uh, we love them. And if you aren't an Audible user, we have a special deal. <laughs> I feel like Oprah or something. Guess what you get today? You get a free audiobook. Any audiobook, whatever, any audiobook of your choice, the Audible offers, you can have it for free. Just go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. That's our free little code for you. I mean, it, it's as if you walk into a bookstore, take a book and walk out. And you're, but you're not stealing. Audible actually is like, yes, this is fine because you're, you're uh, viewers or listeners of The Social Hour and we love you guys. So they wanted to give you guys a little gift. Check it out. See if audiobooks are your thing. I guarantee you that uh, when, you're, when it's late at night and you're, you're lying in bed and maybe you're not quite ready to go to sleep yet, but your eyes are tired. I, I, I can't read. When I'm, when I'm at that certain point where I'm not ready to go to sleep yet, but I'm I'm too tired to, to hold a book and, and reading will make me tired. An audiobook is a great way to kind of send you off into, into dreamland. So Just relax. Yeah. Exactly. Audiblepodcast.com slash social hour is the URL. And we thank them so much for their support of this here show. All right. All right. So our uh, social tips, Sarah, I know you were going to mention this last week. It's a, uh, a cool service that allows you to display your Instagram photos uh, as a blog gallery via a tag. And before you mention this, I just wanted to share uh, another service that launched uh, and has to do with this Instagram if you're a fan of that iPhone app. And it's called Extragram. Uh, and uh, that allows you to uh, view all of your Instagram photos online and see other photos from people in your network. And this has been a, a bit of a pain for some people. They haven't been able to do this, but Extragram is a really slick web interface that allows you to uh, get that online access. Yeah, I actually, I love Extragram. In fact, once I saw, or let me, uh, I'll uh, click out of here while I sign in with my Instagram account because I don't want you guys to see what it is. But uh, extra Insta, okay, well, we'll look at my, I, we'll look at your pick first and then we'll look at mine and we'll see which one's better. Um, I really like Extragram a lot. 
Yeah, it's really it's really nice. Um, um, I'm not sure if you're able to uh, sort of embed photos on your blog. I haven't gone that far with it. I'm, more than anything, I just liked it because then I could see a, a, an archive of the photos that I did post to Instagram and I can see it by not necessarily being on a, a mobile device. So uh, that's where for me it become, comes in really handy. And it's just a better way to view Instagram photos if you're at a, a desktop or a laptop computer. Well, it's not letting me log into my Instagram account for who knows what reason. But the idea is, is that you can, once you log in, obviously it, Instagram is all about who you're following, um, what people are sharing, and what, what's popular. And so, for example, well, it's not actually going to let me log into anything. We've, we've got this, um, we've got uh, Wi-Fi issues here in the studio, so I'm not really exactly sure what's going on. This happened to me last week, too. Um, That's okay. On Instagram, but yeah. So, so the idea is is that uh, on Instagram, anybody who's got an iPhone is like Instagram's the best. We love it. But again, they don't have an Android app yet. They're working on it, but it's not available to anybody yet. Oh, here I am. Okay, now I'm logged in. So the this is the popular uh, feed, which Instagram users know is a little uh, tab within Instagram. But this is um, a way for you to uh, become a member and be able to look at this beyond your phone. So I mean, you you've still got to be a member through iOS, but you don't necessarily have to look at the interface on your phone because that can be great if you're on the go and walking around and things like that. But this is actually a, a more beautiful way to look at things, mm. I think. So if I look at my feed, for example, this is all the folks that I'm following. Uh, looks like Extragram may be getting hit by some folks. Uh, my photos. Let's go to my photos. I'm sure they'll have that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, basically, I'm sure people can kind of imagine how it works, but it just, it's just taking that whole mobile experience and bringing it on to the internet. So you're able to access all these images and, and because there's so many beautiful Instagram photos, uh, it's just a, a fun and more visually uh, um, rich way to be able to check them all out. Exactly. Uh, Instagram, uh, for whatever reason, seems to be having a bit of a, uh, having problems. a usage <laughs> overload. Too popular, see, Sarah? I guess. I guess. Awesome. I mean, can we, can we call this the social hour effect? I have no idea if it has anything <laughs> to do with us or not. But the other Instagram kind of fun little goody extra that I wanted to talk about last week, we didn't have time to get to it, um, and it's less about um, what my particular Instagram feed um, is based on and who I'm following and who's following me, and more of... Um, image searches via tag. So a lot of people mm. use this with Flickr all the time where you think, oh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd maybe like to look at um, uh, photos that are all tagged with cat, for example. Well, something called Instacat might be the thing for you. And if you're not a cat lover and you're like, oh gosh, there's going to get into one of her cat things, don't worry because it's not actually about cats at all. This is just a clever uh, website URL that they used. It's Insta C. Dot at. But that's just the default search term. So if you see over in this area, if I was to search for dog, for example, then all of a sudden, poof, the site's still called Instacat, but it's going to pull up all the Instagram pictures that have been tagged D-O-G. Now, this um, it depends on people tagging their photos, and Instagram isn't really a robust system that, that, that mm -hmm. Flickr is that necessarily encourages you to tag. I think a lot of people are still getting used to tagging photos or trying to figure out why it's important for them to tag photos. Um, if you if you click on a particular photo, it'll go to the Instagram permalink. We were talking about permalinks earlier. So it's a cute picture of a, I don't know, I guess he looks like a St. Bernard or something or some sort of uh, a mix. But this is, you know, it's a good way to browse. And um, obviously these photos are, are, you know, it's not like a Creative Commons license. So it's not really a good way to, to, to use photos beyond just um, browsing them, but it is a good way to browse photos. I mean, I've got, um, I've got a tag, for example, that I started uh, called Ma Wine because I sometimes have glasses of wine at various places and, and it's not anything that I can find um, at a store and I want to remember them if I need to you know, tell somebody about them in the future. So that's my tag. <laughs> There's only two that's photos awesome. on there, but I'm trying. I'm trying well, to work yeah, with tags They're both really handy sites. I mean, just to kind of enhance the whole Instagram experience. Exactly, exactly. So those are two kind of fun social tips. Instacat and Extragram. Um, Extragram hopefully will be back up. 
uh, another uh, shortly. Yes, exactly. And quickly before we go, because I know we've gone over an hour again, Amber. I think I'm being maybe a little um, too ambitious with stacking <laughs> the show, but we'll get there. Um, we'll get through. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll just power through it. I'm the fastest talker in the world, so exactly. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> still I'm still up. trying to figure out how to be octopus lady here at Leo's uh, desk because it really is harder than it looks. A um, few technical issues, so I'll get there, people. But uh, I wanted to um, to finish off the show with with kind of a funny story about um, that I got into a little bit earlier about not everybody necessarily being a big fan of everybody else and the social web is a place that uh, people get a lot of feedback in, good feedback and bad feedback and everything in between. So there was a site um, that I had discovered, somebody that I follow on Twitter had, had shared it and, and it seemed kind of funny. And this this site, Amber, I don't know if this has been flooding your tweet stream as well. but Yeah, um, I saw it. It's really neat. Pretty much everyone I know is now doing it. And it gets a little annoying when all of your friends start tweeting this out. But the whole idea is that if I was to enter a Twitter name, it doesn't have to be mine, so it can be Amber Mac, um, and I click get your next tweet, what it's doing is it's taking a bunch of keywords from tweets that Amber has already sent out. But it's sort of nonsensical. It's like Mad Libs for tweets. So yeah. when you are right on, thanks, mentioned your event in the fact that is neat. Touchdown. So these are all things that you actually said. And you can probably, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of memory coming from these tweets. Like, oh, yeah, I remember that I wrote Touchdown or maybe I iPod Touch or something like that. And you can keep going. I mean, it's not just one. Uh, yeah, there's different ones. It's kind of fun, too, because you see what you do. I mean, I always write. I use a lot of exclamation marks all the time. I'm the worst for doing that. And so I see anytime it's generating anything within the uh, that can be my next tweet on the, the site you're mentioning, that uh, there's always a lot of exclamation marks because I overuse them. <laughs> Yeah, so at this point, let's say that, uh, and this is actually, it can, you can kind of run into trouble, I guess, a little bit because obviously you can use anyone's Twitter name to put together your sort of funny little aggregate. Um, you can post the tweet. Now, of course, I would not be posting as Amber. I would just be posting as myself. What it does mm. is in my, in my Twitter stream here, it... Um, it brings in my little Mad Lib that I had found and then a link back to the site. So if people are like, what? This is a very nonsensical tweet I don't understand. Um, they can they can click in and see, oh, I see what she was talking about. Anyway, my long-winded story of why this went a little bit awry for me yesterday is that I put in my boyfriend's name and because I thought, oh, this would be great. So what I'll do is I'll find one of the funny tweets, um, you know, that that's just sort of the word jumble and then I'll attribute it to him as if he had said it and people who don't really get it will be like what because he's a reporter so a tech reporter so it's like i i kind of just wanted to be funny about um did he really say this oh my gosh it's funny <laughs> well it turns out that the the what i ended up tweeting had an expletive in it it was the oh, f-bomb no. and i really didn't think about it because i guess in my mind it was like yeah well i didn't say this this is something yeah. that someone else said even though it's not really something that he said it was taken out of context anyway um, in uh, my Twitter stream, I got a lot of at replies from people saying, I can't believe you did that. Why would you do something like that? And I had to kind of think for a minute, you know, this is a really good reminder that not everybody <laughs> has the same sense of humor. Yes. And I have to remember that we are reaching um, on Twitter, on Facebook, and, uh, you know, Instagram, and sound tracking, and, and all of the services that so many of us are using every day. We are reaching far more people than we know on a one-on-one -on -one level and we have to be careful about um everyone's tolerance level and you know kind of what you want to put out there about yourself yeah definitely you just uh, you have to be so cautious <laughs> so that's a good lesson sarah thanks yeah i uh i think i, I learned the hard way lost a few followers yesterday but but uh, I have learned my lesson, so hopefully yeah, they'll come back. I think, yeah, it's. I think it'll be okay. We'll be all right. <laughs> um, but anyway, I guess that's it for this edition of the Social Hour, episode three in the can. Probably worth mentioning um, to anybody who wants to watch us live next Monday. I'm actually going to be on vacation, so Amber and I are going to be uh, pre-recording episode four this Saturday, um, 5 p.m. Pacific time. 8, 8 p.m. rather, uh, Eastern time. So Eastern. that's your time, it's Amber. Saturday night with the social hour, Sarah. It's going to be good. I'm really, thank you so much for sacrificing an hour of your fun Saturday so night to hang out with I'm me. Normally I'm out clubbing. Here. and Yeah, I bet. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll just go out a little bit later. No, that's awesome. Um, really appreciate you uh, rearranging your schedule because we want to, you know, I, we want to we want to give you Funny. a show. We didn't want to just not do a show next week, so we're just uh, we're going to be recording it live a little bit early. But what we will do, if for example you uh, are going to be out clubbing on Saturday night, don't worry about it. We'll rerun the show at its normal time. Next, oh, perfect. Next Monday. So it's yeah, you don't have to think about it too much. It'll it'll be running at its regular time. And then, of course, on demand, you, you can subscribe. You can subscribe via iTunes. We've got audio, uh, a, a small and a large video feed. Um, you can watch straight from our website at twit.tv slash TSH. It's pretty much up to you. Um, whatever you want to do. And, um, and a reminder, uh, normally live on Mondays, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and subscribe and, and watch whenever you want. And we're glad to have you. Amber, I'm going to Thank I you so much, talking. Sarah. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, stuff to cover every show. So we'll have to, we'll speed it up for all you people next time who are listening. Agreed, <laughs> we'll agreed. get it down to an hour sooner or later. We'll have to, uh, maybe we'll come up with like some sort of a cowbell thing. You know, it's yeah, like if I'm just on. going on and on as I tend to do, you can just ring the cowbell and it's like, I'll be forced to go to the next story. That'll just be like our <laughs> unspoken little rule. <laughs> all right, I'll see what I can do. Okay, cool. All right, Amber, uh, see you next week or see you on Saturday. And everybody else, thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time on The Social Hour.